So last year, I made a little video ranking all the trick weapons in Bloodborne. The response to this was about what you'd expect. Now, truth be told, a few of these weapons I hadn't actually used before making this video, and I only tested them on some more basic enemies and thus didn't find them that good, leading to me ranking them low and many commenters telling me that I had undersold their favourite weapon and should give it a proper try. One such weapon which I really wanted to like was the Cos Parasite, just for how wacky it is and for the fact you have to turn into a broccoli man to use it. You only get this weapon from beating the Orphan of Cos, so for most players, they'll only use this in New Game Plus. Well today, using the magic of Save Wizard, I'm going to do a full playthrough of Bloodborne from start to finish, using this weapon only for damage. I guess you could call this... Cosplay? I'm going to add a further restriction to create some difficulty for me. Pretty much every comment about this weapon said something to the effect of, It's great when you gem it up properly. This means grabbing strong gems from deep in the chalice dungeons, specifically ones created by using online codes or glyphs. So, on this playthrough, I am not going to touch the chalice dungeons at all. The only gems I can use are ones found in the base game or the DLC. For those of you thinking, oh well, this is just beating Bloodborne with a normal weapon, this won't be difficult, I encourage you to look at this damage right here from a little later on in the video. Yeah. Although the damage here isn't great, one place you can do great damage is in this video's sponsor, Wanted Dead. That's right, I actually played a non-Souls game for a bit. This stylistic cyberpunk adventure combines hack and slash and third person shooter, developed by the team behind Ninja Gaiden and Dead or Alive. You play as Agent Hannah Stone, who's certainly very rock and roll. You've got brutal melee combat with intense finishes, as well as range cover shooter sections. This game is tough, but very rewarding, and serves as a love letter to those classic PS3, Xbox 360 games from back when I was slightly less old than I am now. You know, given the surplus of vast open world games these days, having a shorter focused experience is kind of refreshing. Upgrade your guns, upgrade your skill, eat ramen, and even sing karaoke. Wait, why is this karaoke minigame so difficult? Oh my god! Okay, so as you can tell, this game is pretty self-aware. It knows exactly what it wants to be, and I've got to applaud that dedication to its identity. The devs have just dropped the first patch for the PC version of the game, adding many quality of life improvements and enhancements. Steam players have already got the update, but don't worry, if you're a dirty console scrub like me, that patch is coming with us in just three short weeks. Want to make enemies dead and wanted dead? Well guess what? There is currently a 50% discount on Steam. That's almost half off. Wait, it is half off! The sale will last till January 4th, so hurry up! The game is also available on PlayStation 4 and 5, Xbox Series 1, as well as on Epic Game Store. Get the game today for a cyberpunk slam dunk using my link in the description and let the mayhem begin. Well, let's get started, shall we? We start by calling our character Octopus and choosing the Cruel Fate class as it has the highest arcane stat. This old man drugs me unconscious, says some really unsettling stuff, and I wake up and run to this door mashing triangle because I forgot this is an Elden Ring. Now, I actually require three things to get this run off the ground. The weapon itself, the milkweed rune, and the rune workshop. So, I need a weapon, a rune, and a key item that I can change into each of these respectively using Save Wizard. The weapon and the key item are no issue, but for the rune, well, the quickest way to get one is to skip to the Forbidden Woods. You have to get this wolf to grab you by the gate here, and then mash the shoulder buttons, which is a fat lot of RNG, but after one hour of pain, I get it at last and open the shortcut gate. In the poison swamp below, I grab one of the very few arcane gems in the base game, which should hopefully come in handy later, and then run up to speak to this guy to join the league and get the impurity rune. I also grab the madman's knowledge here for insight so that we can level up. The next time I come back to the Forbidden Woods will be when we reach here via normal progression, so don't worry, I'm not going to be skipping anything. We actually need 20 arcane to wield this weapon, and luckily we now have enough. With all that done, I now edit in the Cos Parasite and... nothing. Okay, hands up, how many people got this weapon, equipped it, and were super confused when nothing happened? Technically, you do actually get arcane damage on your fist this way, so that's... something. But... We want to go all in, and I've now changed the Hunter's Bell into the Rune Workshop, and the Impurity Rune to the Milkweed Rune. With the Rune equipped, we transform into the glorious Broccoli Man. What a parasite for sore eyes. So, let's look at the Cos Parasite. It's a pure arcane damage weapon with A scaling in arcane. Its attacks are very... tentacly. But, it has a number of other quirks to it. Your dodge now has a very squid-like movement, which seems pretty smooth, 
and it has a bunch of unusual attacks, like the Backstep R1 seems to make you vomit up some white liquid which apparently can inflict poison, although the range is very short. The damage seems… okay, I, I guess? What's weird is that in the two-handed trick mode, you actually can't charge up the R2. Range seems decent at least, but I think the real key point of trick mode is that pressing L2 makes you do like a smaller call beyond type attack, which is easily the most damaging thing this weapon has, although it does cost two quicksilver bullets to execute it. Armed with our Oct Explosion attack, yes that's what I'm calling it, it's probably a good idea to grab some bloodstone shards in the area so we can get our weapon upgraded. Thankfully, I can still do the wolf trick with this doorway to get some echoes and vials and then we upgrade the parasite to plus one and slap a couple of points into arcane. A good thing I noticed was that the tentacles stagger enemies quite effectively, which is handy because the attacks are pretty slow compared to the R1 of almost any other weapon in the game, at least the ones I've used that is. The Oxplosion is still the most powerful attack by far though. Even so, I want to get as much damage as possible so I ran and grabbed some more shards, got some better armour, farmed enemies for yet more shards and got arcane to 25 and leveled up to the parasite to plus 3 just because I could. So now we are ready for our first boss, this beast in this very Atmos Cleric arena. Well, let's see how much the Oxplosion nukes his health. Uh, oh, wow, um, wh what about normal attacks? Oh dear god, I think that might be the worst damage I've ever seen from a weapon this early in the game, that's a plus 3 weapon as well. Now, luckily, the Cleric Beast doesn't do too much damage and is fairly easy to read, but it was a long fight, clocking in at nearly 7 minutes, which I think is the longest I've ever fought this guy for. By far, the most challenging part was when my son woke up crying during the fight and I had to run to the other end of the bridge, leave my character standing there, pray that the Cleric Beast didn't catch up and absolutely annihilate me, rock my son back to sleep and then jump back into the game. Thankfully, with a few spams of the Oxplosion near the end, I managed to just get this done first try through some kind of miracle. This really doesn't look promising so far. But no rest for us, as the next boss isn't much farther on. So far, the damage seems better against Gassy. I mean, that's from a transformed R2, which I feel with almost any other weapon would be better than that. But at least the range is good, and the father here has far less health than Cleric Beast, although can get pretty aggressive in phase 2. I died once when I was trying to see if I could hit him with the Oxplosion in mid-air while he fell from here, but it backfired pretty badly. Second attempt, I timed some Oxplosions pretty well, and with that, Gascon is gone. Past him, we can now grab the Gem Workshop tool and head into the Cathedral Ward. Remember the Arcane Gem we picked up earlier? Well, we can't equip it whatsoever because the Cos Parasite doesn't get any triangle shaped slots. So that's a shame, but I'm sure we'll find some other gems that fit into it. Bryce? Right? Well for now, let's spin ourselves into Old Yarnum. I sprint on through because I want to spend as little time as possible being Gatling gun juriously, set fire to the enemies in this cathedral, and then get poisoned to death by Flappy Wappy here. Our damage is, once again not great. The thing I'm beginning to notice from the damage here, and also from some stats on the wiki, is that a lot of these early bosses have huge resistance to arcane for some reason. It's weird, because without save editing like I've done here, there isn't really any way you could even get pure arcane damage this early on. Was this a purposeful design choice to punish people for doing this? Nah, there's no way, I'm giving him too much credit there. Anyhow, the first part of this fight is pretty easy, you can just walk around a lot of her attacks and punish with some tentacle fun or the Oxplosion. Once she hits low health though, she comes up with a new way to try and preventicle the tentacle, spraying poison mist all around her. In case you're wondering, yes I did have punch and blood cocktails equipped and I completely forgot to use them. This last 20% of her health took half the total time of the fight as I had to constantly disengage to avoid being poisoned, which didn't always go to plan. Thankfully, I brought a bunch of antidotes. At some points, I kept getting poisoned even though it appeared I was far away enough. Often the poison isn't an issue, because usually you can finish her off quickly at the end here, but certainly not with this damage. Towards the end, I stopped trying to heal the poison and just went in with a bunch of R2s, and finally, after 9 minutes, I was no longer starving for victory. At this point, I felt I should probably put a point or two into health and endurance, just to avoid well, I was going to say being a glass cannon, but that implies I do loads of damage, right? I'm more like a glass water gun at this point. With Bloodstarved Beast downed, 
we can make our way up Cathedral Ward, grabbing the Communion Rune for a whopping one extra Blood Vial. I actually amazingly made the drop here on my first attempt, and we can grab the Dole Gear and an Umbilical Cord for our troubles. So, confession time. On pretty much every Bloodborne playthrough, I totally forget that you can go down this way instead of buying the Hunter Chief Emblem to get to the area past that gate. But, this time I did remember, and killed this beast-possessed Dark Soul. After a quick mission through the streets, avoiding this member of the Saxon Five, we finally get to this lift taking us up to just behind the gate of Cathedral Ward. Now, we can start picking up some twin bloodstone shards to further upgrade our weapon and hopefully do some better damage. First, I smash off these two scurrying beasts for four shards total and then head down to Hemwick Charnel Lane. Gotta say, the Oxplosion does great for these hordes of enemies. We grab some more twin shards and we can now get the parasite up to plus six. I don't hold huge hope that this is going to improve the damage all that much. Well, we might as well make ourselves at Hem in Charnel Lane and take out the witches. Our damage is pretty okay here, but this boss is quite weak as it is, so not sure that's a great indicator. Okay, I actually wasn't able to kill one of them before the other revived, so that's definitely not a good sign. I use the Oxplosion to finish off these Hem Wiccans. Before our next challenge, I level up and then grab the Lake Room. I thought this was how you activate it, honest. So next up is Amy the Bandage Faced Reindeer. Think our damage is going to be good? Well, think again. I mean, okay, the actual number is better than we were doing against the previous bosses, but Rudolph here has a lot more health than anything we've encountered. Over 5,000, in fact. After a first attempt where the healing was easily outpacing my damage by a considerable amount, I decided to use Numbing Mist against Dasher. If you want to write that the whopping one damage point done by Numbing Mist invalidates this run, then feel free to do so in the comments below, but you're only allowed to do so if you include your favourite pizza dopping in the comment as well. Mine is obviously anything my Italian wife tells me. But anyhow, I'm talking rubbish here because once again this fight was long. Going for anything more than one maybe two hits results in me getting smacked. Also, there's something I just want to mention here, it might actually just be me, but something about dodging in broccoli form just feels... off. I feel like compared to other runs I've done, I dodge at times where I would normally dodge the attack, but here I get struck. I couldn't find anything online to confirm this, but it just feels slower to me, particularly of trying to dodge in succession. I don't know, let me know in the comments if you've got any insight on this, or if I'm just losing my mind. My plan was to save my bullets for the L2 until the latter phases of the fight, to hopefully bring Dancer down quickly. The jump attack is a really good opening to use the attack, and by doing this, I did manage to stagger Prancer. It still came a little down to the wire, but with one final blast, we're able to slay this vixen. Hopefully at some point I'll be able to fight something which doesn't have a monstrous arcane resistance. One piece of good news is that the gold pendant from Amelia produces a droplet gem, which we actually can equip, giving us a 12% extra damage against beasts. It's just a shame there aren't too many beast bosses for a while now, but hey, it's something. The crustiest of tosses, Master Willem, reminds us of the first word in this game's title, and then we run through Sen's forest, grabbing this solitary bloodstone chunk. Now, I had heard that these celestial minions can drop arcane gems, and they definitely do. Shame again that they're goddamn triangle shaped. I'm seeing a pattern here. Anyway, I grab the clockwise metamorphosis rune, get the blood drunk hunter's eye for DLC access later, and prepared to face the next boss of this area, the black knife assassins of Yarnum. Now, one great thing here is the oxplosion can actually hit all three of them if you get yourself in the right position. They don't have very high health thankfully, but it's easy to get ganged up on, so constant movement is important. At one point, with just two of them left, I foolishly didn't notice I was out of bullets, so tried to execute the Oxplosion and got smacked up for my troubles. But once it's just one remaining, I was pretty much able to stagger the last one with a single R1 tentacle swipe until it finally falls. This was pretty straightforward thankfully, and didn't go on anywhere near as long as the previous fights. You know, I can't quite put my finger on it, but something about Bergenworth just really bugs me. Maybe I should fight Yuri. No. No, I don't think I will. I blast the crust off Willem's face, and then jump down into the lake for a fast furious fight with Romanic Toretto. Now, for some reason, the one boss that you think would be resistant to Arcane is actually weak to it. I mean, we're still not doing amazing damage, but the AoE blast also seems to keep those other spiders away. I'd run in, get one explosion off, run back out, rinse and repeat. She really eats up the Oxplosion, guess that's why she's a Romnivore. It's been good to have a couple of easy-ish fights after the earlier slogs. 
Maybe we've turned a corner on this run? The moon turns red. Will we soon be dead? Well, Yahagul is far from a fun area to traverse, but there are quite a few bloodstone chunks here. I also realised I'd forgotten to sell the doll set, so I did that and got our arcane stat up to 34. With a mad run around in Yahagul, we get enough bloodstone chunks that we can upgrade the Cos Parasite to plus 9, almost at maximum, which hopefully should make some kind of difference to our damage. Please? Especially because we've got to face one of my least favourite bosses in the game, the One Reborn. This boss has over 10,000 health, and our damage is basically the same we were doing to the Cleric Beast even though our weapon is plus 9 now. The thing I hate about this boss is the falling corpses attack, which if you fail to dodge can almost one-shot you, and given how long this fight will take, that's a bad time. Upon some further research of gems, I found that these celestial minions in the Forbidden Woods actually can drop a nourishing waning gem, one of the few gems I can attach to this weapon and actually benefits me. So I equipped the eye rune and went and farmed them for a bit, but after several runs where they literally dropped either nothing or gems that don't fit, I realised that even if I did get that gem, it was only a 7% attack boost anyway, so it's not like it was going to turn the tide dramatically. After a couple of pretty frustrating attempts, I went and grinded some levels to get 31 health, endurance, and 42 arcane. Did this help? Not that much, no. At this point, I was getting pretty frustrated. In normal fights with the One Reborn, you can normally rack up lots of damage to repeatedly stagger it and bring it down easily, but here of course, that's not an option thanks to this monstrosity's tremendous arcane resistance. Anyway, I decided to go in a different direction for a bit. I went and bought Gascoigne's gear, grabbed the Upper Cathedral Ward Key, and headed up to this godforsaken place. This place is genuinely terrifying, with the silhouettes of the Doom Wolves swinging from the chandelier and the surplus of paralysing octopus men, but also it has a pretty important badge, the Cosmic Eye Watcher badge, which makes some crucial materials available for purchase in the Hunter's Dream. The octopus men are normally pretty scary, but thankfully our Oxplosion can actually hit them through walls, which makes handling them a little bit easier than usual. Just ignore the fact that one has a giant head tentacle. I also couldn't resist cheesing these doom walls with this narrow doorway. Pops me every time. And of course, there's a couple of bosses in the area we might as well take on, with the first being Celestial Emissary. This was fine, honestly. They don't resist Arcane too much, and even my normal tentacle attacks managed to hit loads of them at the same time. I saved up my bullets to hit them with the Oxplosion in Phase 2, which definitely helped to keep the numbers down, and with one final blast, I sell a steal the win from this to end this blue man group. Ebrietis, Daughter of the Cosmos, a boss with a face like a mashed up plate of pasta. I often find the difficulty of this boss varies a lot depending on how much she decides to do the charge attack and the head slam. If she does the head slam a lot, the fight's pretty easy. If she decides to spam the charge, then you're in for a bad, bad time. Our tentacles can actually hit the head when we do the R2 attack, which is useful, but we still need to wait for the right openings. Following the head slam, we can get two R2 attacks in if we're quick, squishing in about 800 points of damage. In Phase 2, the opportunities to hit the head become far less and she can chain attacks together quite quickly, but if we're patient and wait out those few attacks where the head is vulnerable, we can get through. I had a bit of a last minute panic getting caught by the frenzy blood, but thankfully I was able to recover, dodge through another round of blood, and show Ebrietus who the true eldritch monstrosity is here as we bring this daughter to the slaughter. Although it feels good to tick off some more bosses, the actual main reason I went that way was for the Eye Watcher badge, so I could purchase Beast Blood pellets from the Insight store. Hopefully this will give us some extra damage for the One Reborn. I kept hitting the One Reborn now till it staggers, pop the Beast Blood pellet, and go to town. But of course, the Beast Blood pellet doesn't work with non-physical damage apparently. Well, there's pretty much nothing else I can do here, so I'm just going to have to push through. This is going to be pretty long and painful. I kept to just quick R1 attacks for the most part to try and avoid being locked into anything that would mean I couldn't escape the falling corpses. About 7 minutes into the fight, with 20% health left, I got hit by his arm and then smashed by some falling corpses, luckily surviving with the smallest amount of health possible. In the last moments, a couple of explosions finally ended this after 11 boring minutes of fighting. The only thing that's been reborn here is my absolute hatred for this boss. With a bit more arcane pumped in, we can mission onwards to the lecture theatre, but the Gudents have nothing to teach us so we're not going to hang around here long. No, we're going to head into this joyous place, and we're going to go fight Mikko Trash. The first phase, with basically any weapon, is ridiculously easy, because you just move right, do one attack, move left, do another attack, 
and repeat for the easy win. Our damage is lower than it usually would be by this point, so it still takes a while, so long in fact the puppets came back to life. Because of this, I was pretty worried about dropping into the room for the second phase, where he'd almost certainly kill me in seconds by spamming a call beyond, but thankfully I was able to find a workaround. By dropping into the room as soon as he teleports into the first mirror, he now stands waiting outside the door. Here, I get just close enough to not trigger him to run, but close enough that my R2 tentacles can hit him. With each hit, he warps back to the mirror and then proceeds to run back to the same spot. I repeat with just a single R2 and he never deviates from this pattern and eventually he dies without the second phase happening at all and giving me an easy victory. But why was I so keen to go this route before any other you might ask? Well, after running past these autumn flashlights, I can now get this giant brain to ride the Tower of Terror. It's a shame that much like the real ride, it breaks frequently. Now on this bridge here, there is in fact an arcane gem which gives an 18% boost to arcane damage and is a droplet so can be put in any slot. There's also the blood rock to bring the parasite to plus 10, but that gem, that could really be a difference maker here. With this in hand, let's go back and clear off some of the bosses we missed along the way. Starting with Dark Beast Parl Jam. I proved I'm the better man with an even flow of explosions and before he could just breathe, he was no longer alive. I next went back to the clinic, got revenge on this damn wolf, killed Yosefka with an unnecessarily powerful attack, and then got the summons that let me travel to Bloodborne's equivalent of Hogwarts. I decided to give myself a bit of a break and use the stairs jump to skip some of the area and open up the bookcase ladder more quickly, but I was punished shortly after for my arrogance by failing to drop onto this walkway. When I at last made it to the top, it seemed that Dumbledore was in pretty bad shape, but he was still able to give me an Avada Kedavra. In all honesty, this fight had been one that worried me because as you might imagine, Logidian has pretty high arcane resistance and likes to spam out some spells. Our damage was... I mean, I probably couldn't go as far as saying it was good, but it was a damn sight better than we'd done against the One Reborn. Phase 2 with him always takes the majority of the fight time, as the windows to attack just get smaller and smaller. I tried using the Oxplosion in the final section of the fight, but found it was pretty RNG whether he decided to dodge out the way or not. Damage was decent though, about twice as much as I got from an R2. The flying attacks seemed to have the biggest windows, so I tried to bait them and then get my attacks in. It was a close fight as I was once again left with no flasks, but he goes down second try which I'm pretty happy with. Ligarius wasn't though, he cried more tears of defeat. It turns out though that I could have made that even easier as just further past Mikolash was a nourishing radial gem giving me a further 15% attack boost. Whoops. Oh well. Equipping this makes things look very promising, and wouldn't you know it, our next boss is actually weak to Arcane. So I'm a go fight the wet nurse now. So let's see how much the Oxplosion does here. Wait, was that over a thousand damage? Oh my eldritch god. Needless to say, the combination of a slow moving boss with huge attack windows and a weakness to our Arcane damage meant that this was one of the quickest wet nurse fights ever. If it does the walking slashing attack, it's really easy to get two of them in, even three if you're lucky. After definitely not getting too cocky and nearly dying, the wet nurse gets left out to dry. Fear the power of the broccoli! With the runes collected, I got Arcane up to 50 and now started putting some points in health. I was thinking the DLC would be our next stop, but then I realised I'd forgotten about Amygdala. I was sure after how quickly we destroyed her on the Gatling gun run that this would be a more challenging encounter. Here's how it went. With that amygdala destroyed, this amygdala gave me a handshake so firm it sent me into a different dimension. I taught this hunter to eat his vegetables, boomed up the boom hammer hunter, and prepared for a game of horse. Here's a fun fact, Ludwig is my favourite boss in the Souls series, and my wife brought me this lovely handmade Ludwig figurine for Christmas. Truly, she is a fire keeper. When it comes to fighting horse and wells, I'm one of probably a small percentage of people who find his second phase more difficult than his first which funnily enough is actually exacerbated by our build. 
You see, in Phase 1, Ludwig does not have much arcane resistance at all, while in Phase 2, his arcane defense doubles, meaning our damage is a lot less. Due to the low resistance in Phase 1, I can cause massive damage to him with the Oxplosion, even chaining several in a row as we repeatedly break his limbs. For Phase 2, I found it was more effective to use R1s and R2s after dodging, as it gave me more time to respond to his attacks, although there were certain occasions where the Oxplosion was okay. After enough patience, I gave Ludwig an honourable defeat by shoving my tentacles into his sternum and I end this nightmare. A little bit of horse humour for you there, very neighbourly. I ran back to grab the eye pendant, crammed it into a random skull that activated a lift for some reason, and then grabbed Lawrence's skull because I needed an ashtray. The research hall held very little of value for me, so I pressed on to fight the failing livers. Now, despite their high arcane defense, the good news is the same strategy from the Shadows of Yarnum works here. The Oxplosion can hit multiple livers at the same time. The bad news is I'm left vulnerable and they can slap me to death pretty quickly. It's basically a lot of running away and waiting for a group of them to cluster together, make sure they're not about to start slapping, and then let off an Oxplosion for massive damage. It doesn't take many of these before blueberries get picked and they become the non-living failures. To be fair Maria, I don't blame you, I'd react that way too if something that looked like this tried to touch me. Now, Maria is actually fairly weak to arcane, but her combos can absolutely nuke my health in the later stage of the fight, so being in that vulnerable state while doing the Oxplosion is not a good idea. But I am stubborn so I pushed through using pretty much just that for the most part, tanking hits where needed, the damage was just too good to pass up. Dodging through her attacks to the side and instantly going for it did seem to work fairly consistently and in one final exchange we charged at each other and I came out the victor as the clock strikes for Maria and she ascends to the astral plane. I can now buy Maria's armor for insight and then instantly sell it for an absolutely ridiculous amount of runes and score myself a few more points of vitality. Before delving into that joyous place where dreams come true known as the fishing hamlet, we best take out the other remaining DLC boss, so we enter the matrix to take on Lawrence the Fishburn Vicar. Now, supposedly he resists Arcane more than anything else, but honestly, if that was the case, I didn't really notice. I think with these gems our damage has finally reached an acceptable level. For most of the first part of the fight, I focused on just dodging R1s and R2s, getting a good series of limb breaks at one point. Once the final phase began, it was Oxplosion time. There's several really good openings, like running in close when he's about to spit lava, which can also get you counter damage if he's still spitting as you hit him. It's actually also possible to get around the side of him while he's doing the crawl, and he can't turn around quickly enough to get you. Two more explosions here got the job done, and we make Lawrence take the blue pill and return to the real world. Feeling a bit under the weather, mate? Maybe some vegetables will perk you up. No? Because I'm pretty sure no one likes these shark giants, I couldn't resist cheesing this one through the walls of the hut. I showed him who the real patriarch of this area is. Now, there's no more time for messing around here, we've got to fight the boss that had me the most worried of any on this run, a fellow cosplayer. So he's got super high arcane resist, although we still do decent-ish damage with our build, but he does have a lot of health, and the windows to attack aren't the most frequent. Plus, there's the usual craziness of Orphan changing his moves midway through, or the second phase catching me with a combo that just wipes me out in one go. I hadn't had too many issues dodging stuff up to this point after Vicar Amelia, but I really struggled here for some reason. After a few deaths, I decided to have a think of those any way I could increase my damage. Going beyond 50 arcane produced seriously diminishing returns, so there was no point doing that. Then I found out there was a really good arcane gem, one of the best yet, right here nearby in the caves by the fishing hamlet. It's a goddamn triangle gem again, meaning I can't equip it. At this point, I was sick of the game mocking me with these wrong shaped gems, but also genuinely curious about what this would do to our damage. So I did what I probably should have done from the very start of this run. I changed the Cos Parasite into the Lost Parasite. The weapon is basically exactly the same in every way, except one of the radial slots is now triangle, so I can equip this gem along with the two we already had. The damage difference actually wasn't that huge. <laughs> Where we'd done about 300 with the R2 before, we now did 363. So it's like a 20% damage boost or thereabouts. Not as all fantastic as I thought it would be. But this, I think, gave me the confidence I needed. I actually went with some normal R1s, and the damage I could rack up in the first phase was quite significant. I hadn't really decided if I was going to use the Oxplosion, but I held off using it in phase 1 anyway just in case. Surprisingly, 
I did find three opportunities to use it right near the start of phase two. The jumping slam attacks are also good for it. I'm genuinely surprised. I thought this would leave me way too open for his chaos. Okay, he did get me there. But for the most part, phase two went probably as smoothly as I've ever had it go. Dodge through the attack, proc the explosion, and one final burst of running tentacles ends this for good measure. This fight was a microcosm for all the issues I'd faced throughout this run, but I'm glad we were able to succeed here. Oh look, we got the Cos Parasite. After destroying the orphan's soul, I think that's what that was, it's time to end this once and for all with the final boss. Weirdly, I did actually have some minor struggles with German. For some reason, even though his arcane resistance is one of the lowest yet, he takes very minimal damage from our tentacle attacks, way less than orphan for example. The explosion damage is good, but he was one of the most difficult bosses to actually hit with it, as he dodges a lot or quickly counters into things that stagger me. I missed a lot of times with it as a result. I actually nearly died right near the end of the fight because I tried to finish him off with just tentacles and he punished my slow attacks hard. Luckily, I was able to heal up and smack him with one last attack to send Pee Wee German back to his playhouse. But we're not done just yet as we've got old whole face to deal with. Ever notice that the whole face design pops up a lot in these games? I actually restocked on bullets first and then absolutely destroyed Moon Presence with the Oxplosion as it's pretty weak to Arcane. So that's it, the run is over. I feel like I say this a lot, but this was a real roller coaster. I went from struggling early to mid game to smashing through some bosses in the later game to then having some struggles against the DLC bosses. I have to say, as much as I love the quirkiness of this weapon, I think there's a case you could make that this is the worst trick weapon. I know the Cos Parasite lovers won't be happy with this, but hear me out. Every weapon in Bloodborne can be greatly improved with gems of course but I'm not sure there's another weapon that's this dependent on these gems to do even half decent damage. With no gems, even at plus nine, the damage was really low, and the fact beast blood pellets don't work and you can't use fire and bolt paper make the issues even worse. I guess, in the weapon's defense, its placement in the game suggests that you probably would only normally acquire it at a point where you've probably already got a whole bunch of decent gems and you'd be able to max it out fairly quickly. It likely wasn't designed for someone to do a run through from the start of the game with it like I have here, as that was only even possible through save editing shenanigans. Regardless, I'm really glad I got to give it a try here, and we've shown that it is indeed possible to beat Bloodborne as a tentacle broccoli man. If you enjoyed the video, consider hitting subscribe to be notified of new content, and leave me a comment below to let me know what your favourite vegetable is. Until next time, have a good one, and see ya.